accessing library computer data. Hello and welcome to another episode of Captain's Dry Dark where it's called Paint Test. Well, with the Enterprise D, as you probably know, if you are working on the Enterprise D, it has a very complex Aztec pattern, as do many other uh, many of the previous Enterprise. However, the Enterprise D's got around about four tones of blue on screen. It looks very white or greyish, but the Enterprise D model has around about four tones, which they repainted for the movie. And so I wanted to make sure I got this right with a test. So if you are gonna paint a model and it's your pride and joy, test it on something else first. So I had a piece of the warp nacelle from a previous model from many years ago which are completely ballsed up as you can see there's a hole in it well I had a, 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 a third party part and I used this as a test and as you can see probably not from here but I'll show you later on close up that it was a success and I'm going to show you the steps I took to be able to actually make the Enterprise D colors anyway let's get cracking <laughs> Although the Enterprise D looked like it was a whitish grey in tone, it was in fact made of at least four bluish grey colours, arranged in a complex layered Aztec pattern that was then repainted for the movie. The reason why the colour looked different on screen was due to the studio lighting and filters used when filming as was the case with Captain Kirk's tunic that everyone until recently thought was gold but was in fact green. So finding the right colours for a studio prop or model can be really tricky as screen grabs from a TV show or a movie will not be accurate to the real object under normal lighting conditions. But we're lucky as the 6 foot studio model was sold at auction and gave fans the opportunity to see it up close and thankfully someone took loads of really good pictures under normal lighting, even including a tonal card for reference. At the time of filming this vlog, there are no Enterprise D masking stencils on the market. The only supplier was Don's Light and Magic or DLM that produced a masking stencil that was only designed for the basic two-tone paint scheme, which I bought, but then I decided not to use. Sadly, the owner of DLM, Don, passed away this year, and the company is no longer operating, although there has been internet chat to say that the family might start it back up or sell it on. So this means I needed to make my own stencils, which will mean that I have to painstakingly score pages of complex patterns that will probably take me so long that there will actually be warp drive in space. So I scanned the hull decals from the later round 2 recast kits and traced them in Adobe Illustrator as vector art. Vector graphics, unlike Photoshop art, are calculations in space that are also able to be produced as real objects. This can be sent to a CNC machine, pre-cut machines or laser cutters, which I wanted to do for the laborious job of scoring lots and lots of lines. After reaching out to the pre-cut community, someone gave it a go for me. However, this option didn't work due to the close detailed scoring required that ended up tearing up the masking paper. After calling five different companies, the laser option seemed to be the winner with one company saying it can be done. However, the notorious coronavirus struck the world and the development and deliveries of test samples halted. So rather wait, not knowing when things would go back to normal, I bit the bullet and decided to crack on and make the most of self-isolation. So would you like to enter into a competition? Well, not in this episode, but in the next episode because next episode is titled Le Car and that gives you an indication what you will win. That's right, over my shoulder here. So when I've been doing these vlogs, many people have emailed me or left comments below asking me for this design. In fact, the previous episodes, I used other fan art, but I decided as a graphic designer, why use other people's artwork when I can do it myself? So 20 hours later, I made my own, but I didn't make it just purely for the display stand, which I originally wanted to do. I thought, 
in for a penny, in for a pound, I'll make a great big A1, A2 size poster, which you can win. So if you look at the next episode, Le Car, uh, I haven't published it yet, but if you subscribe, click on the button below and enter it the next episode, you will be in with a chance to win this fantastic detailed design. This method of painting the D might be familiar to some, as I'm following the same procedure as JG Model Works, who has become an expert in making this model and has completed enough of them to make it an art form. So my traced vector was not a waste, as it was at least clearer than a decal sheet, which I corrected from feedback from the online community. This became a great visual guide for me to score on. So I adapted these to fit on A5 sheets, so they then could be printed on Tamiya's masking paper on a standard inkjet printer. Instead of using a cutting mat, I used a glass surface for these, as the blade won't dig in too deep as I only needed to score the sticky surface and not the backing paper. It lengthens the life of the blade and there's no risk of the cuts following old score lines underneath. At first I used a steel ruler, but after a while I found that I quickly got into the knack of gaining a steady hand. So I discarded the ruler, which also meant I no longer had the issue of catching the edges on the scored panels and pulling them up as I moved the ruler across the sheet. When it comes to painting large areas, I always recommend using tinned car paint, or if you're American or Canadian, auto paint. It's cheap good quality, easy to use, ready mixed and less hassle. But as these exact colours aren't available in a spray can, I had to use an airbrush. I'm using a dual action airbrush. This means it controls the amount of air and paint being used. I got this particular model from eBay with a mini compressor, which is surprisingly cheap but you can easily get the same result from a much, much cheaper single action airbrush with tinned compressed air, which is fit for purpose when using stencils or painting large areas. As the model will be handled a lot during and post painting, gloves are an essential tool to have. This is so to protect the model's paint job before having a chance to protect it with varnish. Although there are great recommendations for the exact paints to use, some brands just aren't available in Europe, unless imported, such as Model Master. And buying paints online is difficult, as web pictures aren't going to be real life colour accurate, just because they are RGB, red, green and blue, other than CMYK. So Games Workshop to the rescue that has the best range of good quality paints that are also surprisingly good value for money. These aren't normally words that anyone would associate with this store. Seeing that it's global, my reference to the colours means that you can purchase the exact paint in your country. So for the enterprise, I identified Administratum Grey for the base colour, Rust Grey for the secondary colour, and a mix of Fernrisian grey and white scar for the highlighted panels. So yes, I know the Enterprise D has four tones. I said it at the very beginning of this episode, but I'm doing it in three. Why? Well, because the Enterprise D studio model, or the big one, was huge. It was six foot, and so you could see all, all four tones. But at this scale, you can get away with free. And uh, and that's what it's all about. It's about enjoying the model. I don't want to go, go painstakingly into making four when no one's really going to see it unless you're like really hardcore Star Trek model maker and you can pick it up. But it's all about making it look cool and uh, pretty much at a glance, yeah, it looks like the Enterprise D Studio model. Another plus is that Games Workshop now do an airbrush paint range, which can be poured straight into an airbrush without having to do any watering down yourself. Before using paint, always give it a good shake to make sure the settled pigment is mixed with the solution. Pour into the airbrush and then apply the base colour sweeping back and forth with even strokes. Before I forget, I did put down a primer of matte black from a car paint can. This serves as a function of giving the paint something to adhere to, and also acts as another barrier to stop unwanted light making the model glow like a lampshade. 
top tip. To help speed up drying, I'm using a hairdryer I stole from my girlfriend's drawer. To apply the mask onto the model would be difficult due to the amount of scored parts. But the genius of JG Model Works method is the use of press and seal. Designed for covering food, this has a slightly tacky side, but instead of food, this was going to be used to hold in place the scored side of the mask by carefully pressing on it. And now it allows a slow removal of the backing to reveal the sticky side of the mask. Then it's just a case of aligning it on the model, pressing it on and being careful to avoid air bubbles and creases. Once I'm happy it's in place, I slowly remove the press and seal film where it will leave the mask in place. Now this is just a test piece, so I'm not fussed about misalignment or messy score lines. This serves the purpose of giving me a lesson, an indication that I'm doing things right before applying the same process on my actual model. As there's not many of them, I started with the highlighted panels that are painted on the mask. I carefully peeled them away and placed them on grief proof oven paper so I could place them back later. This was so the painted highlighted parts were protected when I got around to laying down the secondary colour later. As I couldn't find the exact paint match, this was the only tone I had to mix. One part white to the Phrygian grey, or however you meant to pronounce it. But in retrospect, I feel I need to add a little bit more white when I get round to actually adding it to the model. As this isn't part of the airbrush paint ready range, I needed to add water to get the thickness of the paint down to something like a milk consistency. Too thick will clog up the airbrush and too thin will make the colour transparent on the model. After a quick blast of the hairdryer, I replaced the masks I had put aside to protect the colour from the next layer I'd be applying. Then I removed the secondary panel masks. This would be the rust grey. Although these paints are airbrush ready, I found that they benefit from adding a little bit of extra water to help with the flow as you just don't know how long they've been sitting on a shop shelf. A quick blast of the hairdryer, and now I can see the fruits of all that effort. This is only a test piece, so I'm not being too careful when removing the mask. So at first glance, the contrast and the colors look way too harsh and inaccurate. And that's because it's not finished yet. There's still the magical stage of flattening, which will make it all come in line with the studio model. Masking will always leave a slight step of built up paint in the edges and sometimes bleed. So I need to leave it overnight for the paint to naturally harden so I can perform the next step. Using 1200 grade wet and dry sanding paper, I lightly sanded the surface with a little water. This gently made the three layers of paint feel like one continuous flat surface. Now the final stage to achieve the correct tone. Watering down a base coat of Administratum Grey, or however you like to pronounce it, this will make the paint thinner and translucent. So when applied lightly over the entire pattern, this will lighten and blend the colours to be harmonious. Not only are all the panels still visible, they now all complement each other to a lovely tone that looks pretty damn close to the Generations paint scheme, which I'm really happy with. So what did you think? Leave a comment below, see if you like the three tone pattern over the four tone pattern. By all means, give it a go yourself. However, I like to say I'm sorry for the attire, it's not exactly Captain's uniform, but at the time of filming, it's summertime and the coronavirus is still at about. So self-isolation, it's hot and stuffy in here. So apologies for that, I'll spare you that in the next episode, which reminds me, competition. Make sure you click on the subscribe button where you will see the next episode when I publish it and I'll tell you all the details, how to apply, for the competition to win this awesome design where a printout will be made and sent to you. In the meantime, you take care of yourself and live long and prosper. Bye. Accessing library computer data.